welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Hugh Patrick, director of the Center on Japanese Economy and Business at Columbia Business School. Uh, on behalf of the Center, I am happy to welcome you all to today's lecture, Leading After a Nuclear Disaster, with Mr. Naomi Hirose, uh, Executive Vice Chairman of Fukushima Affairs at Tokyo Electric Power Company, uh, TEPCO. Um, he's, in, he's the former president and CEO of TEPCO, but he's decided to continue in this activity because of his ongoing concern about the Fukushima difficulties. Uh, uh, I think we're particularly honored to have such a, a senior, experienced, distinguished uh, executive with us today. Um, Mr. Hirose has dedicated over four years to TEPCO, beginning as a young staff member. He joined in 1976, and he developed, a, and I think in part the reason he joined was because he had a passion uh, for, the, for the energy, thank you, for the energy industry uh, following the 1973 global oil shock. Uh, throughout his career, he's developed expertise in corporate planning, sales, marketing, customer relations in the course of, of his different management assignments. Two years after he became an executive officer at TEPCO in 2006, he created and led a Japan First campaign promoting the economic and environmental benefits of electrification, which was called SWITCH. Uh, I assume switch on. Uh, uh, in 2010, he played a key role in the company in expanding its vision toward global expansion. Following the March 11, 2011, Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami, uh, Mr. Hirose again demonstrated his leadership and commitment, dedicating himself to creating the TEPCO system for nuclear damage compensation. In 2012, he became the president and CEO of TEPCO and led several major projects, including issues such as water management, decommissioning plans for the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station, uh, compensating for the uh, earthquake accidents, and re revitalizing Fukushima as well as keeping uh, TEPCO competitive in, an, in, a, in the electricity industry was becoming deregulated exactly at the same time. So he had uh, two sets of really major problems to deal with. Uh, currently, he is executive vice chairman of Fukushima Affairs, continuing on a personal basis, I think, in his own commitment to reconstruct and re revitalize Fukushima Prefecture. Uh, uh, before joining TEPCO, uh, Mr. Hirose received his BA in Sociology from Hitotsubashi University in 1976. And uh, after joining TEPCO, uh, TEPCO sent him to Yale to, uh, for his MBA from the Yale School of Management in 1983. Uh, before turning the floor over to Mr. Hirose, please turn your cell phones or whatever wonderful equipment you have onto silent so that we don't have any interruptions. After the presentation, we will have plenty of time for active Q&A. So Mr. Hirose, I look forward to your remarks. Well, thank you. Thank you, Professor Patrick, for your kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Naomi Hirose. Um, it is my great pleasure to be here to speak to you this afternoon. I'd like to thank Columbia University for providing me this opportunity. Well, it has been almost eight years, over the eight years since the accident of our Fukushima nuclear power plants. Fortunately, uh, the plant condition, current plant condition is very stable and the uh, situation of the surrounding communities are getting better day by day. Although the accident itself was very, very severe, but fortunately we, we learned a lot 
from the accident, and then we experienced a lot since the accident. So I think it's a very, very great honor and pleasure to share some of these lessons with you today, and then update the situation of the uh, plant and then surrounding communities today. Um, let me, uh, I would like to speak maybe 30, 40 minutes, then I'd like to answer to your questions. So I, we have a lot of QA time, so please uh, ans ask me the, uh, whatever you would like to know. Since it's been eight years, so I wonder how many, how much you remember the accident itself. So let me begin with what happened exactly eight years. Um, it was Friday afternoon at 2.46, very, very large uh, earthquakes hit Japan. Uh, with a magnitude of 9.0, this one is the uh, biggest in Japan's recorded history. It's fourth biggest in the world recorded history. And the epicenter was right in front of our nuclear power station, about 10, 100, uh, 110 mi miles away from the coast. And what happened at the, at the time of the earthquake uh, in, in, in our nuclear power plant was so-called scrum. Scrum means inserting control rods between the nuclear fuels so that it stopped nuclear fission. Stopping nuclear fission means stopping power generation. So this plant is power plant, but it needed power for itself. The power was supposed to come from outside in, the, in, the, in these cases, but unfortunately, one of our power pylons fell down because of the earthquake, and we didn't receive any power from the outside. The immediately after that, um, emergency generation systems, such as turbine generator, diesel gen generator, batteries, started working, started producing power. Using those powers, we control the uh, nuclear power plant again. And I was at the headquarter. The first report that I received from the nuclear power plants was that uh, Scrum was successfully made, and we controlled the power plant. I still remember that I was very much relieved with this first report, because at uh, Japan, we have a lot of big earthquakes, so that uh, we had had this kind of scrum situation before, the ac before this accident. So I thought this was one of the, those past events. But uh, unfortunately, 50 minutes later, at 3.36, devastating tsunami hit Japan. Probably you have seen uh, the tsunami approaching to Japan's co east coast uh, on TV news or something some, several times. Unfortunately, nobody in our nuclear power plant was taking video of a tsunami approaching to their nuclear power plant. Probably they are busy handling the situation right after the, the earthquake. But fortunately, one guy was taking a video of a tsunami approaching to his thermal power plant. He's in a thermal power plant. That thermal power plant is called Hirono Thermal Power Plant. And this summer plant is located just 20 kilometers, 12 miles south of Fukushima Daiichi. So it's very close. So why don't we watch uh, his video? This is a Pacific Ocean. Sorry, it's kind, kind of difficult to see. And this side is north, this side is south. Tokyo is this side. Again, this is not a nuclear power plant. This is thermal power plant. Please take a look at these automobiles. They look like leaves. And these are the tsunamis coming. Okay, this goes on and on, so why don't we stop it? 
And this is a map of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station. You need one, two, three, four, five, six. And this blue area was inundated with seawater. They washed away turbine generators, batteries, electric boards, and pumps. And uh, we lost power completely. We became totally blind. And it's called station blackout, SBO situation. Probably you know that the nuclear fuels keep vast amount of heat even after the nuclear fission stopped. So we had to cool them down by recycling water. But after the pump stopped, and then, first of all, power stopped. So we couldn't cool them down anymore. So the temperature of the nuclear fuel start going up, going up. And then nuclear fuel loads are covered with the metal called zircon. This material start melting at the temperature around 1500 degrees Celsius. So it started melting and then formed vast amount of hydrogen by the chemical reaction with water. And hydrogen, hy hydrogen is lighter than the air. So it's, it went up. And then nuclear power plant building has no wind. You know, it's sealed. So that the hydrogen piled up and then accumulated inside the building of the top, top of the inside the building. And then we still do not know what ignited hydrogen explosion. But at that time, we still, have a many, we still had many, many aftershocks. So those, those electric bulb might fall, fall down or pipe shaft might fall down, anything could happen. So something ignited and a nuclear explosion, I mean a hydrogen explosion took place at unit one, three, four. And then top of the building, because of the hydrogen was on the top of the building, so at the top of the building was well, exploded and the nuclear uh, radioactive material spread outside and spread outside the plant site. This left-hand side map shows the dosage level of the surrounding communities. This one was uh, as of April 2011, so just one month after the accident. <laughs> Obviously, the wind came from southeast to northwest, so that the uh, contaminated area spread toward the direction of northwest, this way. Plant was planted here, so it went this way. But take a look at this right-hand side map. This one is November 2017, so six and a half years after the accident. It looks better, much, much better now. Because it, uh, we did a lot of decontamination work in this area, and then also, as you know, that the radioactive level goes down as time goes by. So it both worked, so it looks better now. So this is the evacuation zone. Right after the accident, Japanese government uh, designated the, the evacuation zone within a ra radius of 20 kilometers, so somewhere under here. These are the evacuation zone. But the, the radioactive level goes down so that the uh, e evacuation zone is getting small and small now. And, but still two towns left uh, remain in uh, evacuation zone still. But uh, this green area, area and the yellow area just was just released last week. Uh, no, this uh, green and yellow area is no more evacuation zone, so it, it's open now. And then this pink area, uh, the, the size area is 370 square kilometers. So this is 3% of the total of Fukushima Prefecture. A Fukushima, the size of the Fukushima prefecture, prefecture is very similar to the state of Connecticut. So probably you have kind of images, 3% of the state of Connecticut still remain uh, in uh, evacuation zone. And this is the number of the people uh, had to uh, be evacuated. It, it started from something like 160,000 people. And then still 20,000 people cannot go home 
even if they want to. This is not, this is not the number of the people who actually uh, left homes and then live other area because that, uh, even those people living in those uh, area, they left and they moved. So that uh, this is a, a number of evacuees who used to live in uh, uh, evacuation zone. So actual number of the people who left uh, their hometowns is probably double, uh, nearly 50,000 still. And then because it's been eight years, so that uh, their lifestyle changed very much. The kids went to uh, primary school, now going to high school, colleges. So that uh, I don't think the 100 percent people will come back because it, the life is, has been changed very much. But still, those 20,000 people cannot go home, even if they, even, even when they like to go home. So, what one of, one of our one of the typical responsibility is try to restore this area as soon as possible, so that the people can go home if they want to or when they want to. That's that's one of our job. This is what happened eight years ago, there and thereafter. Let me talk about the current situation of the nuclear power plant. Uh, this uh, cross-dimension view shows that uh, uh, each of the uh, units. As I said, that the plant condition is stable now. The cooling water is being circulated uh, continuously, and temperatures and, and other parameters are being monitored 24-7. I, th I think we are controlling the plant and uh, stable. And we also improved the uh, working condition in our power plant. Probably this is a very uh, familiar picture that you've seen many times. This is a 2013 uh, map. This is all red. Red means that we have to wear this a uh, very bizarre protective gear. Full face, full face mask, three pairs of gloves, and two pairs of sh uh, socks. And then, but we, you know, decontaminate this area very much. And then now, 96% of this area is what we call green zone, where we do not have to wear any protective gear. So whenever you would like you, you you come and visit visit Fukushima Daiichi, you you can come to this power plant with your regular clothes. Even no no surgery mask is needed now. So this is this is what you see now. So the working condition in this plant has been very much improved. Uh, but still, I would say there are two major challenges, difficult challenges ahead of us. One is uh, removing spent fuels from the plant, and the other is uh, removing fuel debris, molten fuels uh, from the plant. Let me talk about uh, spent fuel first. In each uh, plant, this upper right-hand side corner, this is a uh, spent fuel pool. So there that the spent fuel still left in this spent fuel pool. Please take a look at unit number four. Unit number four was not operation on March 11, 2011. So that all the fuel, fuel was supposed to be in this reactor. All the fuel had been taken out from the reactor to the spent fuel pools. That's why there were 1,535 fuel bundles in this spent fuel pools. That many fuels. Uh, were in this spent fuel pool. So I, we thought that this was very big risk because at the top of the building, uh, because number four had also the uh, hydrogen explosion, so number, the top of the building exploded. It's, it's open. So uh, we thought this was very, very risky. So first, we tried to take this, these 1,535 fuel bundles from the spent fuel pool. And four years ago, it took one year but we completely taken away uh, these 1,535 bundles. 
So now we are trying to take these 566 fuel bundles from unit number three. And unit number three also had uh, explosion on the top of the building. So the, the top is this mess. But first we had to take those rubble out of the top of the building. Then we built this cylinder shaped uh, structure on top of the building. Inside, we installed the crane and a fuel handling machine. And uh, just this week, Monday, probably you've seen the news, just this week, Monday, we started taking uh, some nuclear fuel from the unit number three. And then, yes, in Monday, Tuesday, we took seven out of 566 fuel bundles. So we just started. But uh, um, the, the radiation level here inside this building is relatively high still compared to the unit number four. At the unit number four, it wasn't very uh, uh, high radiation level. So men went there and then control the machine, manipulate the machine, and then took the 1,535 fuel bundles. But here, it's a little bit higher, so I, we, I don't want my people be exposed in this area. So every operation has to be remotely controlled. So it's, it's a little bit difficult. So it takes, although the number of the, number of the fuel bundle is just 562, Six, so it's one third of the unit number four. But it, it will take more than a year. It's a little bit less than two years. So anyway, we just started uh, the operation. Let me talk about the debris. Debris is a nuclear, you know, fuel, modern fuel. The condition of the each unit one, two, three is different. But uh, we we analyze that uh, the you know. Nuclear fuel was supposed to be in this reactor, standing, but all of them are modern. And then, for example, unit number one, I would say most of the modern fuel dropped through the, react through, through the reactor and stayed, dropped, stayed in this uh, the basement of the uh, containing vessel. But uh, on the other hand, unit number two, although the, the fuels are all molten in the reactor, but the, only a few portion drop down here. And then unit number three is in between one, two. And so the situation is different in each uh, unit. So we, had to, we have to develop the different shapes of the robotics to let them in. And for unit number two, uh, the penetration of this vessel is so narrow. That's why we developed this kind of the uh, you know, fishing rod, fishing line type robot. And the end of the line, we put this camera and then some monitoring device and collecting data. And we put these robots here and then drop the line here. And about a year ago, we took the picture of this thing. This is it. This is, uh, this is, this is, uh, picture taken from the above here. Oh, it looks uh, very ugly, first of all. And uh, I, I don't know what it is. It looks like uh, lava, right? And then about two months ago, we tried to pick those pebble up, sorry. We tried to pick up those pebble we put the magic hand type things and then grab it and then lift it. And let me show you the video of that. This is uh, both sides of the hand. It's like a scissor. Okay. It's, it's try, try to grab, hold it. Then lift up. See? Okay, so I, I, we think that this is a one, one great step ahead. And uh, we now know uh, we can pick up those things. 
Oh, this time, we didn't take anything out of the uh, vessel because we didn't prepare any container. So it's easy to take it out, but uh, what, we, what shall we do this, this thing? So before we, took, we take something out, we have to prepare the container. And so within a year, we will pick up some very small portion of things and then take away and then examine the ingredients of that and then plan again. And, but uh, we also found out that the surface of the lava, uh, for example, these things, we tried to scratch, but it was very stiff. We found that this is kind of st stiff. So next time, we put something, some, some cutter with the, with the magic hand and tried to chop it. So anyway, anyway this is a very small uh, step, but uh, we learned a lot of things. So we have to, we, we can't you know, jump to, to, to the end uh, instantly. We have to uh, take a step-by-step -step approach, but uh, we, are, we are moving forward. So this is about the current situation of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Let me, let me uh, explain the uh, financial situation of TEPCO. This is a historical profit and loss uh, chart of, the, of TEPCO. Because that the, uh, the accident happened here, so we recorded huge losses in three consecutive fiscal year. But uh, since the 2013, fiscal 2013, and then 2000, fiscal 2014 just end, you know, March 31st. So it will be next week, we will disclose that the financial report for the fiscal 18. And fiscal 18 is similar to fiscal 17. So we have recorded uh, so, so good profit since 2013. Six, so it will be six consecutive a year. And compared to the, those figures in, before the accident, it looks so, so good, doesn't it? But actually, it isn't. It's not easy. Let me explain it. This is a total estimated cost of the accident. And this estimation was made, made by one of the committees of the uh, government. It consists uh, of th three parts. One is, a uh, one is a nuclear damage compensation. The other, th next is decommissioning, uh, decontamination uh, expenses, and decommissioning expenses. The total estimated cost of the accident reached 200 billion US dollar. And three quarter of this, 145 billion, is TEPCO's responsibility. So we have to make 145 billion. This is too, too, too huge to imagine, don't you think? This is too, too huge to, 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 to understand how to manage or how to do this. So let me put it this way. Fortunately, this amount uh, we do not need this much cash at this moment, right now, fortunately. So why don't we, because it, uh, decommissioning takes 30 years or 40 years, so why don't we, uh, let me divide this 145 by 30 years. So it ends up $5 a year. Still very, very large. But uh, let me check that the, our past performances, starting from 2015, and then probably 2018, the same. Um, we spent compensation expenses about one point some billion dollar a year, each year. And then also we spent decommissioning ex expenses a similar amount a year. But still we uh, recorded ordinary income of two point something. So total is almost five billion dollar. I'm not saying that we can do this for another 26 or 27 years, or it's not an easy thing. But uh, as CEO, this $5 billion a year was a very, very important benchmark 
to me to manage the company. Because the 145 is too big, you know, too, too big to think about what, 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 how we you know, deal with. So I always, uh, at the, every financial report, I always benchmarked these figures. And if it's over $5 billion, it's good. But if it's less than $5 billion, we have to catch up for the next year. So it doesn't mean anything uh, for the financial standpoint. But uh, to me, it, this, these numbers are very, very important. Let me talk about the activities outside uh, nuclear power plant. As I said, that uh, in order to, for the people evacuated uh, to go back when they would like to go, go home, a lot of things are needed. Not compensation money is not enough for them to come back. For example, ADS means very, very much. Their, their houses are messed up. Wild animals are running around. And uh, they need to, when they come back home, they need to weed, weed uh, the plants or snow shoveling in, in, some, in winter or cleaning up their houses. Those, those things, those work are needed. So these activities were, have been done by TEPCO employees on a voluntary basis. Of course, I asked them to help, but I didn't force them to do that. That's, you know, in, in a, the branch offices in Tokyo metropolitan area, people just go to Fukushima, our people, our employees go to Fukushima and do those things. And then see what, what the situation of the, those community and feel how big the, the impact of the accident is. And sometimes they, they, they meet the local people and then have, have some, some kind of conversation with them and then come back to their, to their uh, field offices and then tell what he saw, what she did, what she what kind of conversation they had, how, how they feel uh, to their colleagues. And then one of the other colleagues started saying that I'm gonna go next week there and do these, these things. This kind of the, how do you say, chain, chain reaction continued in the past six, seven years. And the total number of the person days spent in Fukushima area doing these things reached over 460,000 person days. And then these activities were very much appreciated by local people, local mayors of the towns and cities, and then and, you know, pe even people evacuated. And I know this is very, very Japanese way of taking responsibility. But I'm very much proud of my people they have been doing very, very well. In closing, let me ex explain the lessons that I, we learned from the accident, uh, that I learned from the accident. I learned a lot, but I listed here in three uh, things. One is a safety culture, and the money is a effective communication, money is a building solidarity. Let, let me talk about safety things. Since we had that big accident, We've got to learn a lot about safety so that we never uh, have this kind of the, uh, bad accident again. And so instilling the safety culture, we've been trying to instill safety culture in everybody's mind and doing these things. But it's not easy, you know, it's, you know, it's not easy to, to, to build the, the real safety culture in your organization. It's really busy and difficult. And then I recently found that uh, the reason why it's so difficult is that uh, um, there is a very, very big threat to safety, which is budget and schedule. People, maybe including you, think safety and meeting schedule budget are mutually exclusive. They do not stand together. It's kind of trade-off situation. 
Don't you think so? Yeah, people, people th tend to think that way. It's kind of a natural thing. So in that, as far as you think that way, as far as our people think that way, ultimately, at the end, I would say, you prioritize budget or schedule over safety. I bet. Because, it's simply because, even if you violate safety rules, the accident wouldn't necessarily take place, right? If you ignore the red light and cross the street, the accident wouldn't take place necessarily. It's dangerous, do not do that, please. But, uh, it, it, right? But uh, if, you, if, your, if your budget exceeds the original one, or if you can't finish your job by the end of the scheduled day, it's obvious, right? And then your boss wouldn't be very happy with that. So that no matter how many times you repeat safety first, safety first, safety first in every morning meeting, if you, if you are in a very, very difficult position, I would say many, many people would prioritize budget or schedule over safety. So, so it's, it's, that's why it's so difficult to, to keep that uh, real safety culture. So what I'm telling now is that uh, I ask them, please, please search for the optimal way. Uh, optimality. I, I ask them, that, please believe in the optimality. Uh, which is the safest, and then fastest, and then least expensive. Let me give you an example. Imagine your job is digging a hole, and then put some equipment in it, and then cover the, uh, the hole, right? And you start digging a hole at 10 o'clock in the morning. And you complete that the hole, and you put something in it, and try to cover that hole. But by the time you start cover the hole, it's getting dark. So you have to stop it. And then, but you can't leave the hole wide open so that you put the temporal cover on it. And then you hire two guard men and put one each on the both side of the hole so that the people passers by might not fall off. Fall, the fall down, and keep that things during the night, and then start uh, your job next morning, and then complete it. This kind of things always happens everywhere, I would say. But what if you start digging a hole from 6 o'clock in the morning? You might have finished everything by it's get dark, and that you don't have to pay you know, don't have to hire two guard men. You don't have to put a, a temporal cover, or you don't have to leave the, the hole wide open during the night. So safe and less expensive and on schedule. You, you completed your job by the end of the day. So this is maybe this example is too simple, but uh, I am, I'm asking to my people that they're leaving that there is a very, very optimal way, which is cheaper, which is faster, and which is more economical and, and, and on schedule and safer. So that's, that, that's what I'm telling now. Let me talk about that. Uh, the, OK, sorry. This is, this is a what, example. You know, people prioritize needed. But anyway, so next effective communication. TEPCO made uh, many mistakes, many similar mistakes uh, when disclosing things bad, many times. We always disclose something bad, uh, not immediately. We, we made the same mistakes again and again and again. I don't know why people make same mistakes again and again and again. And then I think that the people in the field, particularly technical people, tend to 
disclose the bad news after they scrutinize, they, after they find out that the real cause is. Because that they know when they disclose something bad, they would be asked, what was wrong? What's your countermeasure? So they know that. So that before they disclose things, they'd like to know the answer. So, that, so, so they try to scrutinize things and then disclose a bad thing. And then media accused TEPCO. TEPCO is trying to hide something again. This, this, this happened many times, actually. So what I'm telling people uh, that please do not afraid of saying, I do not know yet. I am checking now. If, if, let me give you an example. If something bad happened at 1 o'clock today, and you disclose something bad, that thing, at 1.30, 30 minutes after, you can say, I do not know the, the real causes. I'm still working on it. I'm still checking on it. But what if you disclose something bad happened this 1 o'clock tomorrow? Can you say that I'm, I'm st I don't know, I'm still working on it? Right? It's, it's kind of difficult. You know, say, peop, you know, media people would ask you definitely, what were you doing for 24 hours in the past 24 hours? So I'm, that's, this is, this is uh, the things that I'm asking them, do not afflate. So, you know, just immediately um, disclose things so that you can say, I, I, I do not know yet. The third lesson, building solidarity. I would say this is the most important lesson I learned from the accident, since the accident. As a, uh, at the time of the accident, the number of employees of TEPCO is about 40,000. And among them, roughly 10% 10, 10 of the people, 3,500 or nearly 4,000 people, belong to nuclear-related section. And then the other 90% of the people uh, have nothing to do with nuclear. Their job is climbing up the electric pole, electric pylon, and fixing the wires or collecting money, or collecting electric rate tariff or something like that. And, uh, but if, I would say for the, those 90% of people, it's kind of inevitable, it's kind of nat natural to feel how come my salary was cut? This is nuclear accident. I had nothing to do with nuclear. My job is you know, fixing wire. How, how come my salary was cut? Right? I would have felt that way if I belonged to uh, in these 90% of people. But we have to make $5 billion a year. Snow shoveling and weeding and cleaning up the houses are needed for the people evacuated when they to, 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 to go home. So these, these things can't be done by 10% of the people. So we got to have that cooperation support from all the members of TEPCO. So this is most important things that when your organization is in deep trouble, you have to get together. You have to have a sense of the solidarity or sense of togetherness so that uh, they share the, the same problem. This is a common problem. It's not your, your problem. It is not the nuclear power plant problem. This is our problem. So we got to share this. We have to take, everybody has to take the same kind of responsibility to these uh, things. And so what I did, uh, was uh, I visited uh, field office as many times as possible. And uh, to tell the truth, the CEO of TEPCO was really, really busy. I didn't have much time. Yeah, I didn't have much spare time. But whenever I have a time, I visited field offices and then met um, our people in, in, in the offices and then try to have a direct face-to-face, eye-to-eye communication with them. And uh, every time I explain the situation, 
But I, what I told them was rather uh, not sweet things. I talked rather a difficulty or reality that we are facing, that we, fa we have to cope with. And then I didn't talk about you know, rosy, bright future of TEPCO or that kind. I rather talked reality. But at the end, I always added, we can do it. I don't know how, how it works and then how, how effective my visit to those field office or my, my direct communication with them. But uh, fortunately, um, TEPCO people still keep a very high sense of responsibility and then very moralized and then have a very strong uh, motivation. And although that the, the challenges ahead of us is really, really big, it's really difficult, it takes a long time to complete uh, responsibility, but uh, with the support from all the employees of TEPCO, we will definitely uh, take responsibility of this accident. Thank you very much.